Uh, look, thank you everyone. I, I, I realize we are running way behind schedule, so I'll, I'll actually try to regain some time. No, don't worry. Uh, Thanks. Um, I'm a professor at Mount Sinai. I'm giving a deep science talk tomorrow, which is the more academic part of it. Can I just briefly introduce my role uh, as founder of Linus Biotechnology? It's a precision exposome medicine company. Uh, I realize the word exposome is probably uh, not well known in this audience because it's, it's a new area of research. And in a few slides, I'll, I'll, I'll convey what this means. But let me start off by you know, uh, sharing why we started this company, the scientific academic co-founders. I share the journey as a parent. My, my, one of my children has you know, neurodevelopmental issues. It's not autism. She was misdiagnosed once, but that's what started this journey. And I decided to just stay on with it. Our mission is really, rather than put on some corporate vision statement, I just want to put families at the center of this and also bring in my own personal experience, both working at a hospital and as a parent. These are the kind of things that, that we encounter uh, as you go on this journey. And it seems to be irrespective of whether someone like me who is in healthcare and folks who come from outside healthcare, it takes a long time to find out whether you have autism. There's a saying in, in, in autism, at least, on Sinai that if you go to two different autism clinicians, you'll walk out with three different opinions. Um, and then there's all this focus on genomics, and I've seen some of these reports, including the reports that are on my own children, and then I struggle to understand them myself, even though I have you know, multiple degrees. But what does all that mean? What does all that, what do I do with all this, all these you know, four-letter sequences? Somebody yesterday at a round table discussion said it very well. They said, sometimes it feels like we've wasted the past 50 years because we don't have an early diagnostic test. We don't really have a fully developed treatment that works on all children with autism. So that's, that's really the, the, the foundational inspiration for, for setting up this company. Now going back to what is precision exposome medicine? So a colleague of mine is retired now from Berkeley, he did this paper. He analyzed a whole bunch of European identical twins and discordant dizygotic twins and came up with heritability estimates. Everything that you see in black bars says that the heritability is driven by non-genomic factors. And autism is somewhere balanced. It's about 50-50, depending on which estimate you believe. Some will say mm, the heritability is 70%, others will say 40%, but let's say it's 50%. If most of the efforts by the NIH, most of the funding, most of the efforts by academics like me have been on the genomic side. So our company focuses on the non-genomic components. But studying the non-genomic components comes with a real challenge, and that's this. So the day you're conceived, your base genomic sequence is set, and it will not change. You'll have some epigenetic changes, but your base genomic sequence is confirmed. Whereas your non-genomic components change on the scale of hours and minutes. What your metabolism was doing this morning, right after you woke up and had breakfast, is very different to what you're exposed to and how your body will respond to tonight, just before you go to bed. So, our exposome is highly, highly dynamic. None of these snapshot measures of doing blood tests here, a, a single urine test, or anything like that will work. So let me show you some real data to convey what I mean. When I remove this black box of time, what I'm going to show you is real data. It hasn't been altered in any way. No averaging, no smoothing, no, no fancy statistics. But this is a person, let's say we collected one blood sample, and we're trying to measure something that's bad for you. It's a, it's a toxicant. And you think, yeah, this person's OK. It's as close to the 0 on the x, on the y-axis as possible. So this person is, is perfectly fine. What I'm about to show you in the next slide actually is seven years of work. And before I do that, I don't want to just flip over this. It's a very difficult challenge. It's so difficult that we ended up writing a book about it as we were launching a, launching a company. If you want a free copy, just email me. I've got a whole stack at home. But if you want to buy some, I, 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 won't, I won't say no. <laughs> it's, my, it's my best shot at an early retirement. <laughs> Here's what you see when you remove that black box, right? This person in their history about 400 days ago 
before we, we collected the sample. So over a year ago, had a huge dis dysregulation. This is 2,000 data points. But let me tell you what the real innovation is. All collected from a single sample. We use a single sample of hair to generate data that is like collecting 500 to 2,000 liquid biopsies sequentially. So we had gone back in time two years. We've used other such approaches for our, our platform in ALS. We've gone back 50 years. That uses a different tissue, and I, I won't go into that. So in a sense, if blood testing, urine testing is giving you a snapshot, what our platform does is give you a molecular movie. And we can measure tens of thousands of features in a single scan, in a single run, with truly a multi oming platform. In a simple way, think of this. What is our innovation? Why is time important? I always ask this question when I give a lecture as an academic. Name one part of your body that's static. Can you think of anything in your body that's not moving? Your bones are turning over really slowly, but your neurons are firing at a rapid pace. Nothing in the human body is static. I don't take credit for this statement, because it was actually said many years ago by a person much smarter than me, that if you really want to understand the universe, always think in terms of dynamics. And that's why the book was called Environmental Biodynamics. Much, much because of, of his, his teachings. So how do we do this, right? It turns out the idea is, in, in a sense, very simple. If anyone's ever seen a tree that's been cut down, and you started looking along the growth rings, and let's say you, you count backwards to seven, and you see a ring that's really thin and, and a bit dysregulated or a bit garbled up, you'd say, oh, seven years ago, something happened to this tree. There was a drought, the tree got sick, something happened. That very simple idea is what we are doing here. There are growth rings in human hair and also in baby teeth, the two tissues we use, that allow us to go back. The other thing is these tissues are very stable. So a large part of our research was going on just before the pandemic hit. Come the pandemic, in, our patients are in New York, the epicenter of the pandemic. No one's coming to a hospital for a research study to hand over a blood or a urine or a saliva sample. But all of this stuff is stable, hair and baby teeth. So you just put them in an envelope and ship them out. And that's why we're able to do multinational studies very cheaply because we have no shipping and transport costs. But here's the thing. The idea is very simple. Operationalizing it took many years. We had to build our own robots, build our own lasers, and then have a deep data science. The reason we couldn't just duplicate data science is if you look at genomics, sure, or any other omics, they measure many, many things. What we are doing is measuring many, many things at many, many times. And because of my lab being at a big academic center, I have three NIH centers, we have collaborations. We have populations in over 10 countries that are actively collaborating. Here. So we have studies in the, in the thousands. Mr. Sarikaji and I were talking, and she talked about, she said, OK, what about the robot and everything? So I told her I would show her a little movie. And I thought, well, why not share it with everybody? So now, because we're out of time, I'm going to just go to the interesting part, what I call the money shot, uh, if I can get this to play. Two minute mark. So, oh, I better be too far. So that's the robot doing its thing. It's just section, micro section the sample. Remember, we're working at micron scales here. It goes, deposits it in a, in a vial that we can take to a mass spec, and it dutifully keeps repeating this because this work is too precise to be done by a human hand. So we had to build this robot, and now we're building version three, which will be even much more high throughput. I'll skip out of that. Okay. So. Sure, we developed the hardware, we built these lasers and robots. The thing is, when you're measuring tens of thousands of molecules at hundreds, sometimes thousands of time points, you have huge amounts of data. So you've got all of this data, you're not going to start recruiting 10,000 participants to do your first study. You have to still stress test what you're finding. So the way we do it is we replicate it, and we replicate it, and we keep replicating it. We really stress test our algorithm. Let me share with you one, one autism study that we did. We took identical twins in Sweden, some identical and some not identical. And let's say, okay, we're controlling genetics to some degree. In identical twins, we are really controlling the underlying genetics. In discordant twins, not so much. 
and we found a signal. And we bring it to New York and we just study siblings. So they're not, no longer are twins, they're siblings, but they're still in the same household. Then we go to another population in Texas where we just recruit from the general community. Okay, is that enough? No. After that, we go to Japan. We recruit pregnant mothers, collect a sample at one month of age, then we have to wait four years, five years before they get DSM-5 diagnosis. Is that enough? Well, yes, we've separated them in geography and by genetic correlation, but have we really separated them in time? We're looking at the non-genomic factors. We change from generation to generation. So we went to the UK, we got samples that were biobank on patients who were born in the 1990s. So now we have separation in terms of how re related you are to the control, whether they're a twin or a sibling, geographic separation if you're Swedish, Japanese, or a New Yorker or a Texan, but also separation over decades in the UK. All of this science is out there has been published uh, from work in teeth, and then we replicate the work across tissues and hair. Hair is obviously much more useful. You can collect it much more easily than waiting for a child's baby to, to shed. We publish all this across different tissues. We publish some of our data science work. It's, it's out there for everybody to access. And all of these papers are open access. You don't need a library or, or a medical school membership to get them. They're all open access. The beginning of my, of my talk, I said, let's put families at the center. But now let's put families and clinicians at the center and think that you're sitting in the clinician's office. What do you really want to know as a test result? Do you really want to see that huge genomics uh, readout that gives you a lot of academic, you know, interest saying, okay, there's this micro deletion here, there are 150 genes, or you have this, and then you can't really action that. So we use our AI algorithm to say, let's break it down into something that's clinically useful. At the end of the day, you send us a sample, and this is what we can tell the clinician. You either belong here, hopefully that's where you belong, but I suspect many of you are here because that's not where you or your children ended up in the control. So you end up somewhere where you have ASD, all right? But we also want to start subtyping, and we can do much more subtyping than this. I'm just showing you a simple example where we said, sure, you can separate autism from control, but what about separating autism from the next nearest condition? And we pick ADHD. So here, in, in, in the green, you have just ADHD. But the blue ones have both autism and ADHD. And now we are working through different subtypes of autism. There's a whole group of autistic children who have gender dysphoria. It's a very understudied aspect of autism. The prevalence of autism in children who have gender dysphoria is like 20%, something like that. So it's very high compared to the general population, almost times 10. There is the regressive autism that, that we, we've talked about as well. So we are continuing to subtype all the different types of autism, but always keeping in mind this picture in the head is there is a family sitting in a clinician's office. If what we are doing is of, of is not actionable, then it's not worth us doing. We got breakthrough designation. This is a slide for you know, self-promotion. It was pre uh, uh, created by my marketing guru, so there's a bit of cheesiness there. But we did get FDA breakthrough designation, and as far as I know, we are the only biomarker from birth to 21 years that the FDA has given a breakthrough designation. But a breakthrough designation does not mean full approval. So after this, we took all this data, we went to the European regulator, and they actually gave us CE marks. So in Europe, we have the full, full approval, and now we're trying to find partners to provide, provide this technology in Europe. So a little bit about the young entrepreneurs in the room. This is my journey. If there are academics who are trying to you know, uh, go down this path, maybe there's something useful in here for you. I joined Mount Sinai in 2013 as an academic, um, previously at Harvard and at the University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, I started off as just as three people, but I'm a terrible negotiator. My startup package was really, really, really small. A, I was among those three people, so uh, that is a lesson for you. Ask for more early. But by 2019, we were the largest environmental medicine lab in the country. We had three NIH centers. We've grown to over 55 people, or at least I'm signing 55 pages. I, I never see 55 people in my lab, so <laughs> let's, see what, let's see what's going on. We have a whole bunch of patterns, not just on autism, but ALS, psychosis, schizophrenia. Many autistic kids have GI and GI disorders. So we have patterns on, on that aspect as well. Uh, we have two strategic pharma partnerships. So we are doing uh, our platform, because we are a platform, uh, not just a diagnostic, 
It's being used in a phase two autism trial and a phase two nutraceutical trial. Obviously, we are cognizant of how the FDA pathway can take longer, so we are also going down the nutraceutical pathway. Uh, I already mentioned the FDA and the CE mark. So what we are doing now is we are rolling out uh, our clinical testing so we can provide early detection. So at least they can take advantage of the existing early intervention strategies. We can start uh, you know, working with early intervention providers to modify their approaches because it's a cash 22, is it? it's a chicken and egg problem. They say, well, we can't develop therapies at six months of age because we don't know who's going to get autism at six months of age. And we say, well, you know, we want to detect autism early so they can get early intervention. So I've been talking to these people who are the, the, the newer generation of you know, bringing in digital therapy, all different kinds of things, especially during the pandemic. Those families who couldn't go out, how can we deliver therapy to them? Finally, I always give this example of diabetes. You know, it's not a one and done thing. You have to stay the course in the patient's journey. A sample should come back to us regularly. Uh, Pramilaji, one of the co-organizers here, yesterday shared a personal anecdote that every so often her child has an episode of increased severity. She said, maybe I should collect a blood sample then. Well, actually, that's not going to work because just like your heart attack, it's not what you did on that day that caused you to have the heart attack. It's everything that came before. So you need a way to travel back in time and have a whole history. So what we're doing is we're using the same idea in another study where the, 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 the risks are higher, you know, which is renal transplant rejection. So if you were lucky enough to get a kidney transplant and then you reject that kidney, the chances of getting another one are very close to zero. Our early data suggests that one month before the patient feels anything, you're picking up a signal that you're heading towards a rejection event. So why can't we use that in children where they have episodic periods of dysregulation in autism? Why can't we just have a sample coming in? It's a non-invasive collection at home. It literally takes 30 seconds. It takes longer to write our address on the envelope than it takes to collect the sample and put it and you know and secure it for us. So uh, and we were lucky enough to raise uh, Series A, even though the market situation is like this. I'm very grateful to Bo Capital and I'm Great Point Ventures um, for supporting us. I will stop there. Now, like I said, I did not start off with a corporate vision, but I would like to end with one. So, we're not a diagnostic company. We are a platform. What really surprises me is whenever a child is born, including my own children, they prick our heels, uh, or the baby's heels, and collect a little dry blood spot. And what they scan for using genomic tools barely covers a couple of percent of the disease prevalence, or what the disease is able to experience. We already have this for autism, ADHD, we're working on psychosis, schizophrenia. That itself is more than 10%. So the ultimate vision is that every child that is born will send us just that one strand of hair that we need to sequence the exposome and deliver them with the results that, that are clinically actionable. That I'll, I'll, I'll stop and a big thank you to, to the organizer. I'm, I'm